It's a pleasure to have the Steve Girvin give the first Quantum Center seminar in the Technion. Um, so, you know, most of you know Steve. Uh, he's uh, earned many recognitions, including the Buckley Prize, being the Provost for Research at Yale, uh, and he's done some amazing work in condensed matter and also in kind of quantum computing arena. So, Steve, the stage is yours. Okay, well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, be here, even uh, virtually, and um, to see many uh, old friends. So, I, um, I hope you'll feel free to uh, interrupt with questions. I've set up my screen so I can't really see the raised hands, but uh, someone can... Uh, alert me, I'll be happy to stop and answer questions. <clears throat> I'm going to start with some <clears throat> uh, background on, on circuit QED and then uh, move on to an interesting, at the end, an interesting application of our ability to control individual superconducting qubits interacting with individual microwave photons to use boson sampling to uh, do a, an efficient <coughs> quantum simulation of the vibrational, optical vibrational spectra of triatomic molecules. So quantum electrodynamics, as uh, uh, you know, is this, the study of atoms, or at least electrons, coupled to photons. And the fact that the uh, electromagnetic field is quantized, it's a bunch of harmonic oscillators and the zero point fluctuations of the vacuum affect atomic spectra. So uh, it leads to the irreversible spontaneous decay of an excited state of an atom by fluorescence. Uh, so the 2p state of hydrogen can fall to the 1s and emit an um, ultraviolet photon in about a lifetime of one nanosecond. Uh, virtual fluctuations of the environment renormalize the electron mass and uh, produce a lamp shift which lifts the degeneracy in hydrogen between 2s and 2p because the um, uh, matrix elements for emitting and absorb reabsorbing virtual photons are different. In cavity QED you study modifications of QED by putting the electromagnetic modes into a cavity, either an optical cavity to a fabry perot cavity, or we'll study microwave cavities, which are just empty aluminum boxes that are superconducting and trap microwave photons inside. And this, um, allows you to engineer the spectrum of the electromagnetic fluctuations which are affecting your atom and make it discrete. And one of the reasons we do this is that our artificial atoms are quite large and have a large dipole moment and they can spontaneously emit uh, a microwave photon in, uh, in about less than 100 nanoseconds. If you put in them inside a box which does not have a mode at the transition frequency of the atom, you can enhance the lifetime by at least a factor of a thousand. So we take advantage of that to um, give us large atoms that interact strongly with the electromagnetic field and yet do not spontaneously decay at a high rate. So uh, much of our early work was inspired by uh, microwave cavity QED with Rydberg atoms from the Paris group. Um, and there they uh, had a microwave cavity possibly driven with a drive to put some photons in there. They sent Rydberg atoms to interact with it and measured the state of the atoms and to see if it changed 
we're not able to measure the state of photons. And they can see Rabi oscillations depending on how long the atom stayed inside interacting with the, uh, with the microwaves. Uh, of course, there's also optical cavity QED in which you have uh, high reflectivity mirrors and you drop atoms through there, or these days you can trap atoms inside there. You don't measure the atoms directly, you measure the change in the state of the photons as uh, due to their interactions with the atoms. So in circuit QED, the, you use microwave photons inside superconducting circuits, and you use artificial atoms, Josephson junction qubits, and uh, we're able to enter, to bring QE, cavity QED or circuit QED into a new regime of ultra strong photon atom coupling and do nonlinear optics at the level of just a few photons. So <clears throat> here's a, uh, <laughs> a cartoon of a, a, a real atom, um, not to scale, a hydrogen atom. Here on the right is a uh, superconducting oscillator, or a, if it has a Josen junction in it, a Josen junction qubit. It's uh, seven orders of magnitude bigger in size, a millimeter scale. Uh, the characteristic frequency, transition frequency, uh, or semi-classical orbital frequency is petahertz for the hydrogen atom. The lifetime of the 2p excited state is 1.6 nanoseconds. You can uh, multiply those and define a Q of about uh, 4 million, and the transition dipole moment is about a I. Artificial atom will have frequencies in the gigahertz range by design. The uh, lifetime of the excited state can be about 300 microseconds. The Q is uh, comparable to that of the um, hydrogen atom. The transition dipole moment is 30 million times larger. And that's going to be the secret for getting extremely strong coupling of the atom to the um, zero point fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. So uh, here's an <clears throat> um, early picture of one of these superconducting artificial atoms. Um, and part of it is the Josephson junction which uh, acts as a kind of nonlinear inductor that provides the anharmonic uh, energy level structure to make it uh, the energy individual transitions addressable as they are in an atom. So here's a here's a a. Uh, Different picture of a more modern version of this transmon qubit. You have it's about a millimeter in size. It's a thin film of aluminum evaporated on a sapphire substrate. It's uh, basically a dipole antenna whose two sides are connected by a Josen junction, which is uh, approximately an inductor, but it's uh, it's a Enharmonic inductor, its inductance depends on the current flowing. And the reason for that is that the potential in, in the phase representation, if this is the superconducting phase difference uh, uh, between the two pads uh, of the superconducting antenna, energy goes like cosine of that phase difference. So at the bottom, it looks like uh, quadratic, like a, like a harmonic oscillator, but it's softer than that. So the transition frequency um, is not quite uniform. So if you think of this as an artificial atom with uh, roughly a trillion mobile electrons or an atom with an atomic number a, a trillion, you would think it has a fantastically complex spectrum. But in fact, the superconductivity gaps out the single particle excitations and the long range of the Coulomb potential gaps out all of the collective excitations except 
low frequency sloshing of Cooper pairs back and forth, the dipole oscillations through this nonlinear uh, inductor. So in fact, it's the spectrum of a, a weakly anharmonic oscillator. It's much simpler than the spectrum of hydrogen. There's no fine structure and no hyperfine structure. And the quality factor, as I mentioned, is comparable to that of hydrogen. And, uh, but the tr enormous transition dipole moment corresponding to several Cooper pairs, the zero point fluctuations of the charge are a few Cooper pairs moving a millimeter uh, gives us extremely strong coupling to the electromagnetic field. Basically, it's an atom with its own uh, antenna attached uh, that gives us this ultra strong coupling. So this is what we call circuit quantum electrodynamics or circuit QED. Okay, so if you put one of these uh, <clears throat> transmon qubits inside a artificial atom inside a centimeter scale three-dimensional cavity and you look at the coupling to one, one of the electromagnetic modes which is relatively close in frequency to the transition frequency of the atom and ignore the other electromagnetic modes for the moment. Um, <clears throat> but you don't make the frequency of the cavity precisely equal to the frequency of the qubit. Maybe they differ by 20%. <clears throat> then <clears throat> the dipole coupling in which the artificial atom absorbs a photon uh, is still there, but because the, the it has to become a virtual process because the two energies aren't the same, so it quickly re-emits that photon. And that leads to an effective Hamiltonian at second order in perturbation theory in which you have a single harmonic oscillator corresponding whose excitations are the photons in the cavity. And uh, if I ignore all the, I take advantage of the anharmonicity of the transmon to allow me to just focus on the lowest two energy levels, then I effectively have a spin a half uh, object in a magnetic field corresponding to the excitation energy of the atom. And then I have what's called the dispersive coupling, pi, uh, which is this term. And this term is going to be um, do all of the great things for us. So what can it do? Well, uh, if you look at this, you'll see that the coefficient of a dagger a, which is basically the cavity frequency, now depends on the state of the qubit, whether it's spin up or spin down. And uh, so you can, uh, if you measure the frequent the spectrum of the cavity, the response of the cavity, it has a sharp peak at uh, its natural frequency minus chi or its natural frequency plus chi, uh, depending on the state of the qubit. And those two lines, the coupling is so strong, even though this is a second order effect, this chi is something like dipole coupling squared divided by the detuning. It's uh, still so strong that this, these two lines are separated by 3,000 line width, something that's completely impossible in a, a ordinary nonlinear optics. So by measuring the cavity frequency by bouncing microwaves off it, you can determine whether the qubit is in the ground state or the excited state. And uh, I do a quantum non-demolition measurement of the state of the qubit. It's Q and D because this commutes with sigma z. Uh, but you can also reinterpret this term as saying, oh, actually it's not the coefficient of A dagger A that depends on sigma z, but the coefficient of sigma z depends on the number of photons in the cavity. And that tells you that the, tr the qubit spectrum, the transition frequency of the qubit, shifts by um, 2 chi every time you add a single photon. So that's a quantized light shift. And if you look at the spectrum, the qubit might respond here or here or here or here, depending on how many um, 
photons are in the cavity. So you can use this to make a quantum non-demolition measurement of the photon number and build essentially a photomultiplier. But unlike ordinary Glauber photo detection, this is quantum non-demolition. You can repeat the measurement many times because it commutes with a dagger A and uh, do majority voting to eliminate measurement errors and count in quantum efficiency and so forth and measure uh, 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 photons with extreme precision. So here's uh, uh, a spectrum from some years ago now of uh, 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 qubit when there are zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight photons in the cavity. I told you these were separated by 3,000 line widths. It's not true here because the, it was done in a hurry. The lines are what are called power broadened uh, by about a factor of 100. So. We should deduce from this that microwaves, despite their name, are particles and uh, come in quantized lumps of energy. And uh, so that they're perfectly good photons, just like optical uh, photons. The other thing you can do with this coupling is apply drive tones to the qubit at different frequencies, and they will rotate the qubit or flip its state or give a phase, a very phase to the state. If and only if, let's say, a tone at this frequency will be on resonance, if and only if there are exactly five photons in the cavity. So that allows you to do strange operations like take superposition of photon Fox states with some amplitude and put a different berry phase on each individual photon number state. So that gives you kind of quantum control to engineer complex uh, state electromagnetic states of the cavity. So these are the two control capabilities that we have that I want to emphasize. So we have um, uh, cavity frequency depends on the state of the qubit. So if I apply a tone at this frequency, it will displace the harmonic oscillator that is the, the microwave oscillator, if and only if the qubit is in the ground uh, state. And the tone at this frequency, microwave frequency, will shift the cavity uh, state if and only if the qubit is excited. So this is cavity displacement conditioned on the qubit state. And over here, if I apply a tone not at the cavity frequency, but at the qubit, one of these qubit frequencies that depends on how many photons are in the cavity, I can do qubit rotations around the block sphere conditioned on the photon number in the cavity. And I can do a different rotation in the case where there are two photons and different from three and different from one and different from zero. So this gives a huge level of quantum control that lets you make very complicated entangled states between the qubit and the cavity and to make individual uh, complicated uh, cavity states on their own. Any questions so far? How different is the qubit, cavi uh, qubit uh, frequency from the cavity frequency? Uh, so uh, that's a, you know that's a experimentally chosen parameter, but typically, you know the qubit might be six gigahertz and the cavity might be seven gigahertz, so they're fifteen or twenty percent apart, quite strongly uh, detuned. But despite that, uh, <laughs> the dipole moment is so large that the second order coupling here is still very big. 
But when you apply these tones, they're really at radically, you know, 20% different frequency than these, so there's no confusion. Yeah. Is there a reason to use aluminum and not other material? Um, yeah, so <clears throat> typically um, people use aluminum because um, uh, it has a very nice oxide, which is self-limiting. It magically grows to just the right thickness to make a good Josephson junction. Uh, you might think, oh, I should use niobium, uh, which has a much larger energy gap and a higher TC and so forth. But it turns out that the um, niobium has many oxides, all of which are terrible and uh, produce extremely low Q atoms, Q's around 10. So in the first experiments showing that a macroscopic quantum tunneling and quantization of the superconducting phase fluctuations and junctions that uh, Michel Deveret and uh, John Martinez did when they were in John Clark's lab at Berkeley in the 80s. Uh, they, were, they were testing Tony Leggett's uh, theory of macroscopic quantum tunneling, that the tunneling rate would depend on the, the friction, the coupling to the environment. And uh, they didn't have to build any special environment. The, the niobium uh, junctions gave oscillations with Qs around 10 instead of 10 million. So uh, people have used um, tantalum recently. That's getting some good results. But aluminum is just simple and um, uh, sort of the recipe for making the junctions is just uh, um, very easy. Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah. Can I ask another question? Sure. Uh, what, what happens if uh, omega Q and omega C are, are very close? Ah, so, so, uh, so that was the first experiment we did. We made them degenerate. And then, and then the... Um, the photon can be coherently absorbed by the atom. It's degenerate perturbation theory and re-emitted. And when you diagonalize the degenerate Hamiltonian, you get an upper and lower polariton, which is uh, which Dave Schuster calls those two states uh, Qton and Phobit. It's a <laughs> super a co a combina coherent combination of photon and qubit excitation. And they're split apart by 2G, where G is this dipole coupling. So it's, um, and it's, there's a peculiar um, square root of N, the number of photons in the splitting as you go up. So there's pairs of states, and the splitting rises with the square root of the photon number. So it's quite an interesting. Um, uh, regime and that was the that was the first experiment we did uh, to see the coherent coupling between uh, it's called the vacuum Robbie splitting but it's we, we like to work in the in the dispersive regime where we have separately uh, a qubit like degree of freedom and a photon like degree of freedom with a coupling between them, which has this Q and D form. And then this plus drives on this oscillator and drives that can flip this qubit give us universal control. So here's an example of that uh, universal control. We want to prepare a photon Fox state with six photons. If you have a harmonic oscillator driven by a microwave generator, which is our version of a laser, so to speak, um, you can, you don't, the only states you can produce are coherent states. You can displace the vacuum and have coherent oscillations, but that's a superposition of many different photon Fox states. So a Fox state is a, is a non-classical state, if you will. 
and uh, it's not so easy to make. But if you have present in addition to your harmonic oscillator cavity and its drive, you have a transmon qubit, which is anharmonic, it has this dispersive coupling, and you can drive it. And between the two, you have universal control. You can show by just looking at the Lie algebra of all the commutators of all the control knobs you have. And uh, so, so here is um, uh, two quadratures, the sine and cosine quadratures of the signal that you apply to the transmon and the signal that you apply at a different frequency to the cavity. And these signals have some crazy wiggle, wigg, wiggles in them, which are determined by uh, a grape algorithm, a uh, gradient ascent pulse engineering algorithm, uh, to give us uh, to numerically optimize to give us the transition we want. So here is a function of time over 500 nanoseconds is uh, a map of the photon number, the probability of being in different photon numbers in the cavity. And you start at zero and you kind of rise up and then it wiggles around and almost converges, but not quite, and then it splits again and comes back and forth. And then all of a sudden, at the last second, boom, all of the quantum amplitudes get focused on n equals 6, and you've produced this Fox state. And here is some state tomography with a, uh, what's called the Wigner function for that final state. It's a kind of quasi probability distribution in phase space. So this is the coordinate of the uh, microwave oscillator. This is the momentum. So you can think of this as electric field in the cavity, and this is magnetic field in the cavity. And you see, because of the number phase uncertainty relation, if you have exactly six photons, the phase of the oscillation is completely uncertain. This, that gives us this circular symmetry to this quasi-probability distribution. And these radial sine oscillations tell you that there are exactly six photons in the cavity. So uh, and the way we, I won't go into the details of how we make these measurements, but a key enabling technology that allows you to do that this strong uh, coupling between the transmon qubit and the cavity allows us to measure not just the photon number, but actually to measure the photon number parity, whether it's even or odd, without learning anything about the number itself. And that turns out to be a very powerful thing for quantum error correction, which I'll mention briefly later. Here's is there a question? So, uh, yeah, uh, to, to generate this Fox state, you need a term that changes the number of photons, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so, so, so that's the first order dipole coupling, or, or what, what would oh, that? Oh, good. Okay, yeah, sorry. So, uh, you can apply a drive to the cavity, which couples to A plus A dagger, couples to the electric field, to the coordinate of the oscillator. And you can also apply a drive here, which uh, gives you a sigma x term. So you so can the change. So a plus a is just applying a voltage, or, or what do you? Yes, exactly. A classical a classical voltage applied to a pin coupled to the resonator, um, you know, just gives you a way to put a force on the oscillator and make it begin oscillating. So you can create and destroy photons with that A plus A dagger term. I think, okay, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, so this by itself, uh, you know, obviously it's a diagonal Hamiltonian. The total number of excitations of cavity and qubit are separately conserved. Uh, so you couldn't, you wouldn't have universal control. But if you have a drive here, which can create and destroy photons, and a drive here, which can flip the qubit or rotate it, uh, then you do have universal control. Uh, Steve, uh, can I ask a yeah. question? Uh, yeah. yeah. So I wanted to ask, uh, what is a, so I know it's limited by the chi's, uh, 
time you take for a great post to, in order to create any state you prefer. That's what is expected. But is there any reason to believe that we can go faster? Yeah, so this is a question about maybe you have universal control, but how long does it take to make a complicated state? And the speed limit is set by this coupling pi because you want to, if you apply a pulse to the cavity that's so short that its frequency spread covers both line, both response frequencies of the cavity, it'll respond independent of the state of the qubit, which sometimes is useful, but uh, you can't then make complicated entangled states. Yes, uh, so that sets this speed limit. Now, yeah, but is it a fundamental uh, well, restriction or is it just what we're familiar with? Yeah, um, so it's a it's slightly naive to just say that's it. I mean, you can do clever things. You can do pulse shapes which are fast but happen to have a zero in their Fourier transform here. And uh, there are some other small terms in the Hamiltonian that I haven't described, which uh, often are an inconvenience, but sometimes you can take advantage of them to speed things up. Um, but you have to, to really beat the speed limit. It's quite difficult. Um, uh, you know, the grape algorithm has a lot of trouble converging uh, if you, if you uh, try to go uh, much faster than the natural speed limit. Also, when you go fast, you have to drive very, very hard. And then things, small terms that I left out here can suddenly become important. So roughly speaking, it is the speed limit. In some special cases, you can do some tricks to go a bit faster. Steve, uh, yeah. can, you say, can you say a word how you get this Wigner function? You're measuring two uh, non-commuting variables at the same time somehow. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so this is a, um, yeah, the, so this is a kind of Fourier transform of the density matrix. So you have, you know, row of X and X prime, and then you, you look at a difference coordinate X minus X prime and a sum coordinate X plus X prime over two, and you Fourier transform the difference one, and that gives you this Wigner function. Uh, so it turns out that if you um, displace the cavity, if you apply a drive pulse, which, which let's say you had a coherent state, which is just a blob sitting right there. If you displace that by a, uh, to the, if you wanna know the Wigner function at this point, you displace that point to the origin and you measure the photon number parity. And there's a magic mathematical identity due to um, uh, Davidovich uh, that says that's actually equal to the Wigner function, which is defined in terms of this Fourier transform of the density matrix. It's, <laughs> it's a non-obvious connection, but it actually makes it very easy to measure experimentally if you have this ability to measure photon number parity, which which, uh, you know, I'm not, this is not how we actually do it, but imagine I, I uh, here's the spectrum of the qubit, and I applied a pi pulse, which would flip the qubit if there's one photon, and another tone, I would flip it if there's three, and another if there's five, and another if there's seven. And I just see if the qubit flipped. If it flipped, I know the parity is odd. I don't know whether it was flipped because of this tone or this tone or this tone. I only, I only learn the minimum information that the photon number is odd. If it doesn't flip, then I know it was in 0, 2, 4, or 6. That's not exactly how we do it, but it's sort of morally equivalent. Other questions? Okay, so here's, a, here's another Wigner function of a Schrodinger cat state, which is a coherent superposition of 
coherent states. This is state alpha is just a, its Wigner function is just a blob in phase space uh, displaced from the origin. And uh, here's the blob at minus alpha, and plus alpha. Uh, you see that it's a blob. Uh, so we're not actually violating the um, uncertainty principle because it's classically this would be a point in phase space. The fact that the x and the p do not commute means that uh, there's vacuum noise or uncertainty in each of those quantities, and that, that you know you're looking right, you know you're looking at real actual quantum uncertainty vacuum noise in the electric and magnetic fields in the uh, in the cavity and the fact that it's not a mixture of this plus this but a coherent superposition with a plus sign it can be seen from these very rapid oscillations of the Wigner function or very rapid changes in the parity of the state as you displace up and down vertically and the fact that it's middle fringe is the same color as these guys means this is a plus sign. So this is very interesting for quantum sensing purposes. If you wanted to measure displacements of the electromagnetic field by amounts which are much smaller than the zero point uncertainty of the electric field, this would be a clever quantum sensing way to do that. Uh, so here's a uh, <laughs> an even crazier state. It's like a Schrodinger cat state that's in roughly 35 places at once in phase space. And um, this is the Gottesman Kataya Preskill states that are used for quantum error correction. They're a, they're a grid. Ideal version is an infinite grid of infinitely squeezed states in phase space. Of course, that has infinite energy, so uh, you have to have some Gaussian envelope that uh, limits the number of points in the lattice. But the um, translation properties of this lattice and phase space are very similar to the translation properties of in the lowest Landau level in the uh, quantum Hall effect. And they allow you to um, encode information in the position of this lattice and also to detect uh, errors. So, uh, so Jonathan Holm has realized these in an ion trap mechanical oscillator. My colleague Michelle Devere has a paper coming out in Nature in the next few weeks in which this, this is where this data is from, in which he has not only realized the states done quantum error correction on detecting linear combinations of, of the states. Okay, so these are just examples of the kind of quantum control we have. So let's talk about what we can do with them. So uh, today, um, this level of control that lets us do quantum error correction that actually extends the lifetime of the information this has only been done using these bosonic codes, these oscillator-based or continuous variable codes. And um, I have uh, uh, some tutorials on quantum error correction and bosonic codes uh, for beginners uh, here, if anybody's interested. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in a second. For the future, I think we could make lattices of these um, oscillators and we have a control that'll let us simulate interactions among the bosons and let them hop around on lattices and uh, hop around in the presence of an artificial gauge field so that you could make fractional quantum Hall effect for bosons, in this case microwave photons, and look at Laughlin state at filling factor a half for the first time and look at these um, Peculiar uh, uh, um, and, uh, states with non abelian excitations and so forth. Um, but what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk is to do boson sampling of molecular vibrational spectra. 
So uh, we're gonna, the idea here is, you know, you all know that if people are interested in fermions and uh, uh, quantum chemistry problems and solving for the energy levels of all the electrons in molecules. And that's very hard to do with qubits because of all the minus signs in the fermion determinants and so forth. So you have to do the jordan wigner transformation and you get very complicated multi-qubit Hamiltonians. But people don't quite appreciate that it's equally difficult to do bosons with spin half uh, uh, spins. Uh, because uh, there's no minus signs, but they're complicated combinatorics from having you know, the ability to have many bosons on one site. So we're going to use the fact that we have a native boson in our quantum computer, these microwave photons, and we're going to have two resonators at different frequencies. We're going to have a transmon qubit that can perform nonlinear uh, quantum control on these things. And we're going to use these bosons, the excitations here and the excitations here, to represent the excitations, the vibrational excitations, triatomic molecules of different, um, this will be a programmable simulator. You can change the program to simulate uh, different um, uh, triatomic molecules. And chemists all the time do optical spectra where they try to see these vibrational frequencies and predict Frank Condon factors, so-called Frank Condon factors. So I'll just remind you that in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, where the electron, you know, as you move the nuclei around with coordinate Q1 and Q2, the two vibrational uh, coordinates, the electrons follow adiabatically and uh, there's some gra uh, potential energy surface for the nuclei when uh, you're in the electronic ground state. If you send in an optical photon and break one of these bonds, you excite the electron to an antibonding orbital, then you get a completely new um, uh, potential energy surface. It's a two-dimensional surface, which I haven't been able to draw very well here. Uh, and so the, you know, maybe it's you go to an antibonding orbital and this bond wants to relax and stretch. Uh, but the photon was absorbed suddenly, so now you're uh, in some vibrationally excited state and you're sloshing back and forth on the surface. And uh, the spectrum contains many sidebands because you can start with no phonons, no vibrations, and go to no vibrations, or you can go to one or two, or you can start with one and go to zero and so forth. So there are many, many uh, sidebands on the optical absorption transition. And chemists use those to identify what molecules they have and study the uh, potential energy surfaces. So, uh, so we're going to use our uh, microwave photons to represent these uh, nuclear oscillations. So there's a, a chemists have worked out the unitary transformation in the approximation that this is harmonic and this is harmonic the oscillator, the two-dimensional oscillators are displaced from each other and squeezed. They have a different spring constant and more importantly, the, the, uh, the principal axes are rotated. In this, uh, so it's uh, the surfaces of constant energy are ellipses. They have a different principal axis here than down here. So you have to initialize your states, you have to do a complicated unitary that maps you from the initial um, eigenstates of the initial potential energy surface to the final. And then uh, that involves squeezing the first mode, squeezing the second mode, 
doing a beam splitter rotation between the two modes, then anti-squeezing the first and anti-squeezing the second, then displacing the first and displacing the second, and making a measurement of the photon number distribution in each cavity. It's all described in this recent uh, paper. And uh, if you see four photons in this, cap uh, in this cavity and six photons in this cavity, that, that corresponds to seeing in the experiment four vibrational quanta in one mode of the molecule and six in the other. So here's an example of a result. This is a photo ionization of water with a, uh, some ultraviolet photon comes in, turns H2O into H2O plus, uh, plus a free electron, leaving the molecule in some vibrationally excited state. And uh, you can tell we worked with chemists because the x-axis is in wave numbers. <laughs> and the, um, this, of course, is a problem you can solve exactly because it's, uh, uh, we, we made the harmonic approximation for the potential energy levels. So the exact solution are these solid lines for the uh, spectrum. And uh, this is for the case where the initial vibrational state of the two modes was n equals zero and n equals zero. There are no vibrational quanta. And we have two different methods of sampling, of measuring the number of photons in each cavity. But you can see, so those are the purple and uh, I don't know what color that is, red or uh, peach. The purple version is um, uh, uh, a bit more accurate than two methods. I'll describe it in some detail. But you can see a quite a complex spectra, and if you measure, there are distance metrics to describe distributions like this: how far apart, how accurate the, our our experimental results are to the exact answer. And it's um, for the better of the two sampling methods, the more accurate of the two sampling methods, it's, um, I've forgotten the exact number, but it's above 90%, or 90, maybe even 95. Uh, here's another case of uh, uh, ozone, and uh, starting not in the vibrational ground state, but uh, some vibrational excited state with two phonons in one mode and two in the other. And again, yeah, there's good agreement with the, uh, with the exact answer. So it turns out that using, having built into our little quantum computer native bosons, uh, microwave photons, is highly advantageous. To do this same uh, calculation on an ordinary quantum computer with two level qubits, you would have needed eight qubits plus some. Um, and silly qubits and of order a thousand high fidelity gates, something that's uh, beyond the capability of current, um, current ordinary quantum computers. And of course, as I said, you can do this calculation on a classical computer exactly uh, very, uh, very easily. So we're not showing quantum supremacy over <laughs> traditional computers, but this is a kind of quantum supremacy over more traditional types of uh, quantum computers based solely on qubits. So, so the deviations from, from the exact and the measured solutions are due to, you know, did the algorithm itself to simplifications of the Hamiltonian or due to, um, you know, errors in the operation so, of the device? Yeah, so they're due to errors in the operation of the device, and I'll describe now in a little more detail how we do this. So um, the interesting thing about this is that the typical photo detectors, like there are people uh, trying to do this with optics, with integrated optical systems, but typical optical photo detectors don't, they just tell you there were zero photons or one or more, or maybe they tell you there was zero, one, or many. 
but they don't tell you the exact number of photons. So you can't do our trick of saying, this, you know, we got, we counted how many vibrational quanta were in each mode here uh, and uh, uniquely identified this line. You can't do that. Furthermore, um, our, our method doesn't heat up the photons, so you can measure them again and do actual uh, Q and D single shot boson number sampling. So let me. Uh, so one method is to ask the question. Let's say this corresponds to um, you know fifteen pho fifteen photons in one cavity and three photons in the other. And you can ask, are there 15 in the first cavity and exactly three in the other? And most of the time, the answer is no, because there are 256 possible states. And uh, there's only a small probability that when you sample, you would actually get this particular one. So that's the most accurate method, but it's um, uh, expensive to individually sample all 256 possibilities. Most of the time, you don't gain any useful information. You just say, it wasn't here. That's the more accurate uh, of the two methods. A, uh, but we have the capability of doing true boson number sampling. Because we can make QND measurements, we can ask the following question. First, the uh, number of photons in the first cavity this is the binary digit expansion of that number, and the same for the other cavity. So we can ask the question, is the number of photons in the first cavity even or odd? It's a bit here, zero or one. We can ask, uh, so that's mod two. Then we can ask, what is the number mod four? And that, uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but you can get this bit and this bit this bit binary expansion. So those four bits will give you uh, photon number states 0 through 15, a total of 16, and that'll give you 16. So you get can resolve 256 different photon states in a single shot and get a result every time. You'll get not the, uh, uh, you know, it'll give you the binary bits in the expansion of the photon number in each case. So the circuit complexity cost time is now log of the dimension of the space rather than linear. So that's an exponential gain corresponding to true um, boson sampling. Because we have to keep the uh, ancilla qubits coherent for a much longer time while we repeat these measurements. So we prepare the state once and we make uh, uh, eight measurements on that single state before we prepare the next one, it's more susceptible to error, you know, decay of the qubit. So that gives you these other less accurate numbers, but they still, still have roughly 85 or 90 percent overlap with the, with the distribution. And you get this exponential gain in the speed. So you have to uh, it takes only time log 256 rather than 256. And in the limit of an extremely large number, you know, that exponential would become quite important. So in the future, uh, the next thing we'd like to try is conical intersections of molecular nuclear potential energy surfaces. So there are these uh, crazy rhodopsin complexes in your eye and a particular molecule, retinol, which uh, exists in two configurations, an absorption of a, of a photon can drive you to another potential energy surface. And uh, there's another stable configuration where you rotate one arm of this molecule. And that rotation triggers, catalyzes, uh, a nerve impulse in your optical nerve that sends the signal to your brain. And uh, this turns out that the potential energy surface has a Dirac-like point, a conical intersection, uh, where near which the usual Born-Oppenheimer approximation breaks down because of the sharp uh, 
uh, structure there in the closing of the gap. And we uh, hope to do a, uh, a simulation of the quantum dynamics of wave packets on the surfaces and how they uh, fall into this collection point and go uh, to the cis or trans configuration uh, afterwards. And um, again, with quite, this is now much more challenging to simulate uh, uh, on a classical computer, especially when you include environmental degrees of freedom and so forth. Uh, still possible, but it'll we'll be getting closer and closer to doing things that are um, where the simulation will be able to answer questions that are quite difficult to, to determine classically. So that's what we hope to do next. I think there's a question. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Nathaniel. So I have a question. You mentioned before that um, this method proves the huge advantage, maybe exponential, over the regular quantum computers because you're using bosons to simulate bosons. And my question is, uh, you're also using boson sampling, which we know also to probably have an exponential advantage over regular computers. So in what context can you expect the exponential advantage over the regular computers? Right, so in principle, uh, if we, so, so this is actually, there is this sort of a uh, mathematical problem or computer science problem of boson sampling, uh, just bosons, you know, traveling through a series of beam splitters. And then you look after, um, if you put in coherent states and you measure coherent states, that's a trivial um, matrix, linear matrix algebra problem. But if you put in Fox states, and you want to know where the bosons end up and how often do they end up in the same place and different places, uh, you have to calculate a permanent, which uh, is like a determinant but without the minus signs, roughly speaking. And you might think uh, that would be easier, but actually it's exponentially harder than doing a, a determinant. And so this has been proposed as a place where you might be able to exhibit quantum supremacy over um, classical computers. The scale that you have to get to would probably be, uh, you know, tens or of photons in 50 modes uh, before you were seriously challenging um, uh, classical computers. On the other hand, um, there's some subtle, there's some subtleties here. Um, because you're actually sampling the distribution, you get the high peaks more often than the small peaks. And so your sampling has a um, not multiplicative precision, but additive uncertainty. And it turns out there are approximate methods for computing permanence with additive uncertainty, which are much faster. So it's, it's a complicated story about whether you could actually exhibit um, uh, supremacy over the best classical algorithm. Uh, but, but, but in connection to what you're doing, so how do you connect the boson sampling to the vibrations of the molecules and like how loud should be the molecule that you try to simulate in order to really be in the range that maybe you have a supremacy? Yeah, well, I think, I think people estimate that, um, so if you have a perfectly harmonic molecule, you probably need uh, tens of vibrations spread over 50 modes. But the thing we're, we're going to be able to do is anharmonic oscillators. And there, there are no good methods for uh, accurately computing the spectra. And we may be able to uh, compete successfully with classical algorithms at a much smaller scale. That's what we're hoping for. Um, but that's a less explored uh, problem and something where thinking about how to do now.
Is that even helpful? with the, even with the, you you think you'll be able to kind of get competitive results even with the current kind of noise levels that you have? I mean, um, when you try to scale them up, no. Yeah, no. I think that that that's going to have to be improved for sure. Yeah. Um, basically, yeah. If you have a hard problem and your quantum computer isn't super precise, of course, then there's probably some. It's like having a little decoherence. And then it, the, at some large scale, the problem becomes classical again and easy to simulate. So you have to uh, you have to have a very very good precise operations in your quantum computer in order to beat uh, 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 to make it classically hard to simulate. And the you know the Google claim of quantum supremacy. Uh, the the fidelity of the operations they were getting was you know I don't know forget ten to the minus five or something I mean it it was just uh, barely good enough to uh, to make it classically hard to simulate but yeah so I'm we're not I don't think we're we're anywhere near saying you know we're gonna uh, beat classical computations but I think we're you know the fidelity of of this kind of simulation is vastly better than uh, can be done with uh, qubit systems in current quantum computers so we feel like it's uh, it's a step forward even though it's a long way from any kind of uh, supremacy over classical systems uh, so, yeah, so those are future directions, and uh, I'm also interested in trying to do fractional quantum Hall effect for bosons by techniques that are sort of similar to what cold atom people do. And I think there's a bunch of interesting possibilities for bosonic uh, uh, simulations and many body problems. And uh, so I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Uh, Steve? Uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, Nathaniel, can I ask a question? Uh, I think he's muted. You are muted. Nathaniel. Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Steve, thanks for this interesting talk. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, get back uh, for a moment to the case of a uh, Omega C equals Omega Q. Yeah. Uh, in conjunction with the fact that uh, uh, the system is coupled strongly or weakly to a dissipative uh, environment. Yes. So uh, one can think of uh, uh, many interesting uh, uh, physics questions. Uh, many of them have been worked out. Uh, uh, examples are a spectral narrowing. One level becomes a uh, broader and one, uh, one uh, level becomes narrower as you increase the coupling or the physics of uh, exceptional points. Uh, do you think that um, uh, all these fundamental questions have been uh, beaten to death or do you see some uh, window, some perspective for, to ask new, 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 new questions? Um, well, there's some, some uh... There's some nice recent results from Cater Merch at uh, Washington University in St. Louis on um, uh, controlling the uh, the environment in which uh, decays occur uh, to see to see uh, to be able to produce an exceptional point in yeah, a quantum yeah. system and move around sure. it. Um, I. Uh, You personally are, are not interested in the uh, well, this uh, direction. Uh, you know, I, it's an interesting direction. I'm not, I don't happen to personally be working on it, but I was uh, quite impressed with some of the stuff that Cater Merch has done recently. Uh, it's, you know, there's more theory than experiment at this point. Uh, it'd be good to have more experiments.
Thank you. Yeah. Steve, in the face of um, photon loss and, and dephasing, um, how, how can you mitigate these uh, decoherence effects as you go to more complicated problems? Or does this really provide uh, you know, uh, a glass ceiling to what you can do with this kind of systems? Yeah, so that's a good question. And, you know, in practice, it's going to be quite a challenge. Um, uh, Liang Zhang's student, uh, Kyung Ju No, uh, with, with whom I've been, you know, a sort of secondary collaborator, uh, I asked him the question, is it right now when people use oscillators for quantum error correction, they take a subset of the infinite Hilbert space of the oscillator and they represent a, a pseudo spin, you know, a, a two level system, a qubit. And you can protect that information against errors. But is there some way to protect the entire Hilbert space of an oscillator so it still looks like an oscillator, but it's error correctable? And mathematically, the answer is yes. You, you this is magic tricks you can do with GKP uh, states as these Gottesman, Kataya, Preskill states. Um, uh, if you have nearly infinite energy such states, you can protect a huge swath of the Hilbert space that still looks like an oscillator. So in principle, you know, at a mathematical level, you should be able to do error-corrected boson sampling. But in practice, it's going to be extremely challenging. So um, I think for now, we're going to have to um, uh, accept the fact that there'll be noise and imperfections. Most, ironically, most, as you know, <laughs> most of the noise and imperfections are because we have to use transmon qubits to get our universal control. And the reason we're using the photons is they live longer and have better properties than the transmon, but we can't actually live without the noisy controller. So thinking of ways to make the controller, to make the control tolerant of faults in those controllers will go a long way towards uh, making the bosons uh, better behave. And we're counting on you <laughs> to help do that. Uh, I think if, if I had a question. Um. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, about uh, the fractional quantum whole states, uh, uh, can you give some idea how, how you are going to simulate uh, gauge fields? Yeah, it's uh, similar to, it's a floquet trick, similar to what Adam people do. So if you had, let's say, this is a lattice of uh, um, resonators, and here's, here's two of them, and there's a transmon between them. So these resonators will all intentionally be chosen to have different frequencies. Mm -hmm. And so you say, oh, well, that's like having strong sight disorder. That, that seems uh, maybe not good. Um, the hopping is a kind of beam splitter operation where you just, you know, A, B dagger and B, B dagger. Uh, we, we modulate the phase of that beam splitter at the frequency difference of the two cavities. So we parametrically it's a beam splitter that parametrically pumps the frequency of this guy up to the frequency of that guy and makes them look like they're degenerate. And the phase of the pump that you put in here determines the phase of the beam splitter, the phase of the hopping matrix element. And you, by locking the phases uh, that you acquire on closed loops around the lattice, you can make the photon think it's in a gauge field. It's exactly the same floquet trick as, uh, as the cold atom people use. But for us, we only have to phase lock microwave uh, generators, which is easy since they're all controlled by some atomic clock, whereas lasers, it's kind of much more difficult. So it's, it's the same uh, trick that the... Is it the same trick that the Google people in Santa Barbara did? 
with the uh, Pedro Mushan and uh, John Martini? Um, they did three it, sides in the yeah. No, the I remember that, and I'm I. Uh, it's possible the same, but I, I can't quite remember. That paper was long enough ago. I can't quite remember whether there was another thing involved. But it, but it's sort of the standard trick, yeah. Okay. Um, so there, there's some questions in the chat that I'm going to mirror. Uh, okay. So somebody asked... Um, I mean, how do you encode the harmonic uh, proxim? I mean, with the harmonic potential, uh, where is it encoded? Oh well, it's just the, f the you know this is a harmonic oscillator. There's uh, some energy E squared plus B squared in the electromagnetic field. The fact that the frequency of this has nothing to do with the frequency of the mechanical vibration. That's just a scaling uh, uh, thing we do in the simulator. Um, we don't have to. We don't have to match those, um, and uh, so the harmonic potential just lives inside this. You know, the electromagnetic energy stored in each cavity. And if you wanted to to uh, go be, like do unharmonic potentials, you'd have to. Do the so, you know, the same. Uh, remember, I told you that you can. Fly, we have universal control, so if I had a superposition of Fox states with 0 and 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 photons, if I were to apply one of these phase gates where each Fox state got a different phase, and I made that phase be proportional to n squared, mm -hmm. then I would synthesize the... Um, Evolution, time evolution under a Hubbard U n squared interaction. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can, you can, once you have universal control, you can, and the Trotter expansion or something, you can synthesize any time evolution you want, making them think they're repulsive or attractive or anharmonic or whatever. So that, that's also how you would do to, to, I mean, if you wanted to stabilize some fraction quantum Hall states, that's how you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you have to have some interaction to stabilize it. That's right. Okay, so there's another question. Uh, uh, so does crosstalk between cavities limit the scalability of the simulation? Well, that's an interesting question. You see, that's another reason that we choose these frequencies to be very different. So there is a object here which produces a linear coupling between these, a kind of, you know, natural beam splitter. But because these are highly uh, detuned from each other, when you're not pumping this, that, that linear coupling is effectively turned off. But if you modulate the coupling parametrically at the frequency difference, then it suddenly appears to be on resonance or, you know, as if they were degenerate, and then you've turned the coupling on. So this beam splitter can be turned on and off. Its amplitude and, its, and phase of this beam splitter are under control of the pumps that you apply to this nonlinear object to, um, to turn on the beam splitter operation. So there's a kind of four wave mixing. If you expand the cosine phi in the transmon, uh, potential to take the fourth order term and you supply two fields, two pump fields whose frequency difference is equal to the difference of these two cavities. Then you, you it turns out you create, you, if, you, if you approximate the pumps as classical, you create a quantum beam splitter that can move a photon from here and make up the energy difference by moving a pump photon from one pump to the other. So it's, uh, uh, you can turn off the coupling to, there's a very high on-off ratio for the coupling. And there's a, you can turn off the crosstalk when you want it off. So, so when you're trying to do something like a simulated fraction quantum Hall system, would you have 
<laughs> could you put like several modes within each cavity or I mean is it yeah that might be that might be an interesting way to cut down on the total amount of hardware uh, right now we've mostly done experiments with just one mode but because uh, yeah you could have a cavity with several modes not too far apart in frequency and you could use the same beam splitter with pumps on here to uh, do a, you know, to map any of these modes onto any of those modes with a, a, a sort of matrix of your choosing. So that could be interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, so other um, further questions? Okay, I think uh, it's a very interesting talk. Um, Steve, thank you very much for waking up early and uh, making this happen. Oh, it's my uh, pleasure. And uh, I appreciate uh, seeing old friends and uh, making new ones. And uh, I wish you all the best in these uh, difficult times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you too. And you know, yeah, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Yep, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye bye. Bye, Asa. Bye bye. Bye bye bye. <laughs>